Welcome to today's Postgres conference webinar, Beyond Off the Shelf Consensus. We're joined by Dr. Rebecca Bilbro, who will discuss several case studies of global apps, both successful and otherwise, talk about the limitations of off the shelf consensus, and consider a future where everyday developers can use open source tools to build distributed data apps that are easier to reason about, maintain, and tune. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers and I'll be our moderator for this webinar. A little bit about your speaker. So Dr. Bilbro is a data scientist, Python and Go programmer, teacher, speaker, and O'Reilly author. As co-founder and CTO of Rotational Labs, an intelligent distributed systems company, she specializes in machine learning optimization and API development in distributed data systems. She's also an active contributor to open source software and is the creator and maintainer of the popular Yellow Brick Library, an open source Python package that hooks into the popular Skikit Learn API, you're gonna have to tell me if that's right or wrong, to support visual feature analysis, model selection, and hyperparameter tuning for data scientists and machine learning practitioners. Welcome. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off, take it away. Welcome everyone. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so welcome to Beyond Off the Shelf Consensus. Um, as Lindsay said, um, I want to start with a little bit of a poll to get a feel for um, what type of context each of you is coming from. Um, so, I'm gonna, uh, our first question here. Um, so I want you to kind of put into mind the app, whatever app it is that you're currently working on, you know, whatever, whatever that might be. Um, and think about how much consistency does it require? And so this might be a different answer from how much con consistency does it get <laughs> um, in the current implementation. But if you think about how much consistency um, it needs, uh, you have these three options. Um, eventual consistency is good enough for this app, uh, or we require strong consistency, um, or I have no idea. <laughs> and any of those is a fine answer. Um, and so I will give you a chance to think about that. Um, and I think the way that we're doing this is that you'll raise your hand. So can I see a show of hands for uh, the first answer, eventual consistency? Let's see. Okay, I see one vote for that. Um, how about option two, strong consistency? All right, how about option three? I don't know, which is a perfectly fine answer. <laughs> okay, two or three votes here. <laughs> All right, so that seems like it's the winner um, of the options. So let's look at our second question here. So thinking about that same application that you're working on, um, how concerned are you about compliance with things like GDPR, LGPD, CCPA? Um, so we've got three options. Uh, you know, you did the cookie banner. Um, you know, it's on the roadmap, but you aren't there yet. Um, and then third, you have, you know, total control and visibility over where um, user data is stored and replicated for your app. So you are, you know, not worried about compliance. Um, so uh, votes for the first option. We have the cookie banner. Isn't that enough? Okay. Oh, I got one vote for the uh, cookie banner. Um, how about for option two? It's on the roadmap. Uh, so data compliance on the roadmap, but we're not quite there yet. All right. One vote. One vote there. How about third option? Uh, you know, total visibility and control over where data is stored and replicated. Uh, 
So it looks like two votes there. So that's great. That's definitely where you want to be. Okay, last question. Um, thinking about this app that you are working on, how well does your app support internationalization and localization? Um, so three options here. Uh, you can vote that you track geographic deployments um, and data replication so you can guarantee a consistent user experience uh, for users all over the world. Um, or a second option, uh, you know, you haven't really started thinking about global markets yet in your uh, implementation of the technology. Uh, or a third option, uh, you are doing internationalization and localization, but it's on the front end uh, using the CLDR, you know, get text uh, kind of tooling. So votes for option one, uh, tracking, we're tracking geographic uh, deployments. Okay, one vote there. Uh, option two, um, we're not quite there yet in terms of thinking about global markets for our app. Two votes there. And then, oops, three votes, sorry, counted wrong. Um, and then last option is we do do um, internationalization and localization, but it's manifest on the front end, um, you know, in the, the web application side, not the back end. Okay, just taking a few notes. Uh, thank you for uh, engaging in our poll. All of these uh, questions are going to come up in our discussion um, in the presentation here today. Um, so the main things that I would like to talk about in uh, today's talk are, are these. So first, I want to go over what is consensus. And so for some of you, this might be a review. Um, you know, if you uh, studied distributed systems um, in school, uh, so some, for some of you, this might be familiar, but we'll talk about Paxos, um, Raft, and some of the optimization. So how, how consensus actually works um, and why it's important to the apps that you're building. Um, and then we'll talk about commercial manifestations of consensus. So these are going to be the things that you're either using um, or that you, know, you are hearing about, um, that your colleagues are using, uh, that allow your applications to um, have consensus. Um, then we're going to talk about some case studies uh, for real companies um, that you will recognize um, who started with some kind of off-the-shelf uh, consensus solution and decided to change that um, because of experiencing uh, growth, which is, you know, it's the good kind of problem. <laughs> uh, it's a downside of success. And then last, uh, we'll talk about um, an idea that I would like to suggest for an open source uh, consensus API that I think will help um, address a lot of the problems that come up in these areas. So first, a little bit about me. My name is Rebecca Bilbro. Um, as Lindsay said, I am the founder and CTO of Rotational Labs. Um, I'm also a teacher, so I teach at Georgetown University in the uh, continuing education campus. I teach data science and machine learning. Um, I've written an O'Reilly book um, that's specifically about doing natural language processing in Python for big applications. Um, and I am the co-creator and maintainer of a Python library called Scikit Yellow Brick, um, which wraps uh, Scikit Learn, um, as Lindsay uh, uh, mentioned in her introduction. Um, and actually, Scikit Yellow Brick will make an appearance. Scikit Learn and Scikit Yellow Brick will make an appearance in this talk uh, towards the end. Uh, so I promise all of these things are connected. Um, Speaking of connection, uh, I'm fairly discoverable on social media. Um, so my uh, handle is the same on all of these platforms. So if you're looking to get in touch with me, um, then it should be pretty easy to find me at Rebecca Bilbrow, uh, regardless of the platform. 
So um, in terms of what I do uh, at my day job, uh, my job is to think about this question. Uh, so I'm really, uh, you know, my, my role at Rotational Labs is to think about the nexus between distributed systems and machine learning um, and think about how we can uh, produce data systems that are a little bit smarter. Um, and when I say smarter, um, that can mean a lot of different things, but generally from a machine learning perspective, what it means is systems that are a little bit more flexible, um, uh, meaning that they can attune themselves um, to the context that they're given, to the data that they're given, and they can learn and respond um, and change um, and sort of become tailored uh, for a context over time, given enough information. Um, and so that is really um, kind of the big question that I am working to answer in my role. And I think that you'll see that part of, you know, part of this talk is related to this question. Um, and, you know, thinking about the role that open source software has to play in answering this question in a way that will be um, sustainable for um, the technology uh, community. So, Let's talk um, a little bit about the basics. So uh, for some of you, this might be a review, um, uh, but uh, the review is important because these algorithms are very complicated um, and I will show you just how complicated in a moment, um, but uh, they're, they're very complex, um, they're, they're difficult to prove and they really for you know, most of their lifetime have been the domain of academia and really have not been the domain of industry, um, meaning that most of the vocabulary, um, most of the understanding here about consensus really lives in universities and not in kind of everyday uh, development contexts, which is you know, part of what I think we want to try to change together. Um, so let's imagine a very simple uh, use case. We have a single database, uh, you know, let's say it's a single Postgres um, database. And what we want to do is we, want, we have a single server um, that's handling requests uh, from clients and it's able to update um, values in the database. And clients can do three things. They can give us a key and we'll pass back the value uh, that's put at that key. We'll, we can put new values to keys. So either putting a, a totally new key with a new value or putting a new value to an existing key. Um, and we can also delete keys. Um, so let's think about this context, it's very simple. Um, so in this simple situation, the order of operations is pretty straightforward, right? So it's probably first come, first serve. Um, and in the case of a single server, it's pretty straightforward to keep the operations consistent. So what does consistent mean? So consistency is one of the big, you know, issues, one of the big important things in this question that we're going to be talking about. So um, let's make sure we're all on the same page that consistency means that the system, whether it's a single server or many, uh, you know, distributed system, that it responds to requests in a predictable way. So let's talk about what happens when there's a failure in this simple single server system. Um, and actually failure is, is the norm, right? So I think that um, you know, we've probably all been in the shoes of the person who brought down uh, the system at least once. Um, failure is routine. Um, it can happen because of human error. Uh, it can happen because the power goes out. It can happen because the network goes out. Um, the database can crash. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong. Um, the problem is that when we just have a single server system, when failure happens, the entire system is unavailable. So nobody can look up their values, nobody can write new values, and even worse, if there was any information that was in transit when the shutdown, when the crash happened, that data is probably gonna get lost. Um, so we will lose all of the, um, the information that was um, in, in movement uh, when the crash happened, which is not great. Um, so this is actually why we um, have distributed systems, right? So the whole point of a distributed system 
is to allow us, you know, to face the reality of failure that is very routine uh, and normal. Uh, so, you know, the, the purpose of the distributed system is to have more uh, servers, uh, you know, and so in case a server fails, um, the other server is available um, and can answer requests. And then what we have to do is we have to replicate data um, you know, between the two so that the, the two um, copies of the database, you know, say synchronized. So it's actually very hard um, to keep them synchronized though. Uh, and that actually gets worse. Um, the more servers we have in the system, the more time it takes to synchronize. Um, and so the way that that would manifest for you as a developer or a user is that somebody might put a value um, and have that request, that put request handled by one part of the system, and then immediately um, fire off a get request to make sure that the put worked, except that the get request goes to a different part of the system that doesn't know about the value yet. And so you could get a not found error. And this, this is a common thing that happens. It's because the, the, that latency um, means that the system is waiting to synchronize. Um, so there's another kind of problem, which is concurrency. And this is another big issue. This is one of the main issues that um, consensus is trying to solve, which is what if we both try to put a value to the same key um, concurrently, meaning that from the perspective of the system, they happened at the same time. We both asked at the same time um, so who wins? Uh, that is actually a very hard problem to solve. Um, you can't use just like system clock time um, because if the system is really spread out, then those times aren't reliable. So you have to end up using very uh, complex vector clocks to make sure um, that we're ordering things in a way that is consistent. Um, so there are some options, um, you know, so when, when we say that the, you know, system is consistent, that doesn't actually just mean one thing. Um, we have different levels of consistency, and that goes all the way from strong consistency down to, you know, I guess no consistency is, you know, not on this list. But in terms of what you're used to seeing, it's probably one of these four. Um, and so we talked about uh, eventual consistency, or I, I mentioned it in our poll, um, most data systems that exist today are eventually consistent. Um, so what that means is that if the requests stop, then eventually the system will become consistent. So, you know, it's always getting more consistent and it's just a matter of catching up with the put requests. Um, and so really actually, you know, probably almost any application you can think of um, is likely eventually consistent, um, even ones where it might surprise you. Um, the truth is that, you know, a lot of those applications like these, you know, social media applications and stores where you're, you know, you're, you're buying something, um, what they're privileging is availability. Um, right, so they're they're deciding to privilege availability over um, consistency because they want you to visit the store, um, and so you visit the store and you check to see if there are any laptops left, um, and they say, you know, sure, there's laptops left, even if they're not totally sure if there are laptops left because maybe the system hasn't fully synchronized yet. Um, the problem is that there are a lot of cases where that's the eventual consistency is not really tolerable. Um, so these are applications that require strong consistency, which means that any get request is guaranteed to return the most recent put. Um, and there are not actually very many strongly consistent applications, um, even ones where you kind of wish they were strongly consistent. And the one that I always think of is buying airplane tickets, right? <laughs> and you know, we have this experience of you, you know, you buy an airplane ticket and you think you have a seat and you show up at the um, at the flight and actually two people have been sold the same seat. Um, you know, and that that is what happens when you have eventual consistency, but you want to have strong consistency. 
Um, and so increasingly, I think there is going to be this demand for strongly consistent applications um, because people are going to not be willing to accept eventual consistency as users. Um, and people just are, have been used to, developers have been used to using eventual consistency as the model because we sort of, I think, be believed that strong consistency wasn't um, going to be responsive, responsive enough, that we needed to privilege availability. But that's, I think that's changing. Um, with some of the new uh, tools that are coming out, um, some of the new databases that are coming out, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, so essentially, um, the question is, how do we deal with this as our systems become more distributed? How are we going to deal with um, staying consistent across many uh, replicas? And the, uh, the kind of classic solution is Paxos. Um, so Paxos is an algorithm uh, that's been out for decades. Uh, it was published by Leslie Lamport, um, you know, in this kind of Indiana Jones uh, type article uh, that he um, uh, kind of, you know, it has this sort of tongue in cheek feel, but it's a very serious um, solution to a serious problem about um, solving consistency. So the way that Paxos works is that you imagine that each service, uh, each server is a state machine, and it can apply commands in a single order, um, and that uh, order is the log, the log of operations. Um, and so the question is, how do we, how are we going to enter things in the log so that the log remains consistent across all of our copies? So the way that that happens is that a client makes a request, and the server that gets the request requests a slot in the log using the prepare phase. And so that prepare phase goes out to the rest of the replicas. And if they have that spot free, they reserve it and they respond. Um, and if enough servers respond yes to the prepare phase, the originating server um, sends an accept phase. So an ex a second uh, round of communications that says, OK, we're going to write this value to this slot in the log. Um, and then if enough of the other servers respond in the affirmative, then that entry in the log is committed. Um, and it's committed throughout the entire system. And this is true. And it can be proven uh, mathematically true, even if servers fail. So if a majority of the servers are still running, um, we can prove that, uh, or uh, Lamport can prove proved that um, the system can progress and make decisions and make them consistently so that every log ends up the same. Um, and as soon as any server that's uh, died, uh, comes back up, it can be brought back up to date by synchronizing with the logs from the uh, rest of the system. Um, so the problem with Paxos is that that's a lot of back and forth communication, right? So prepare, accept um, is a lot of rounds of communication. So as you might imagine, it can get slow. Um, and so there are some optimizations that are designed to remove some of the communication to speed things up. And so Raft and Multi-Paxos are two algorithms um, that were developed in response to Paxos that are, are designed to be optimizations in this way. And essentially what you can, you can do is you can skip the prepare phase um, by electing leaders. Um, and in you know, the fashion of following the, the leader, if we know that we have a leader already, then we can skip the prepare phase and just go to the accept phase. The problem there is that if a leader dies, and remember, failure is very common, if a leader dies, uh, we need to be able to detect that and elect a new leader. And so there does end up being a lag, usually in the phase where we have to do an election uh, to create a new leader. Other types of optimizations like Mencius pre-allocates um, slots in the log to different machines, uh, like in a round robin fashion, uh, which allows everybody to work uh, more quickly because there's less checking with each other. Um, the problem there is that you can end up with empty slots in the log, and so you have to apply compaction uh, to manage those empty slots. Other optimizations um, take advantage of the fact that a lot of the times the updates that we're making to data um, have no collision, right? So we're making updates to completely different 
keys, um, values that don't interact at all. Um, and in those cases, we can use something like ePaxos or FastPaxos um, to essentially just fast forward um, and, and apply commits, um, you know, assuming that there's no conflict. The downside there is in the cases when there are conflict, um, everything moves slower, even slower than it would with Paxos. So none of the optimizations um, is a perfect solution. None of these algorithms is perfect. And I hope what this is starting to crystallize in our minds is that there is no perfect consensus algorithm that works in all situations, right? It's very contextual um, and it's important that you know what your application needs um, and that you wanna make an informed decision about what your application needs. Um, so let's think about really what's available to us, um, you know, on the market, right? So what are these kind of commercial consensus solutions? Um, in 20, uh, in, in 2001, uh, Lamport published a new paper uh, called Paxos Made Simple, which was designed to simplify Paxos enough so that industry could maybe try to implement it. Um, and you can tell that he succeeded, right? Because it only took five years of Google using Google scale resources to successfully implement Paxos um, in Chubby. So Chubby is Google's distributed locking service. Um, and it was designed to uh, rescue the Google file system, which at the time was really struggling uh, with uh, the consistency issues. Um, and so, uh, you know, about uh, four years later, Apache offered an open source version of Chubby uh, that doesn't exactly use uh, Paxos, but uses something similar called Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast, um, which is an optimization of, of Paxos. Um, so Zookeeper now is probably many of you um, have encountered Zookeeper in your, your work. Um, and if you haven't encountered Zookeeper, you probably know about etcd. So etcd was originally re released by CoreOS in 2013. Um, etcd is not based on Paxos. It's based on the Raft uh, algorithm that I just mentioned. Um, and it was designed to manage uh, clusters of uh, Linux container. Um, and then the, but what's interesting is that even though that was the original intended use in uh, a year later, Google launched Kubernetes and Kubernetes uses etcd uh, for the configuration store. So now if you're using uh, consensus, you're prob you've probably encountered it through one of these. Uh, one of these. Um, the, the issue is that uh, even if you have found these solutions, it's not sort of guaranteed that they've worked very well for you. So there's this very good paper um, by Alij Young and Chirapko um, and uh, Demervis uh, from 2016, where they talk through kind of what these options are on the market and talk about kind of what some of the problems are with the options, which isn't that the options are bad. It's just that they're not very well understood. And Zookeeper is a great example where uh, it has the paradoxical property that if you use it improperly, which is possible and maybe easy to do, uh, you actually make your, your application less scalable rather than more scalable, which is the whole goal of Zookeeper. Um, and really what these researchers found is that even as the choices for consensus solutions have increased, uh, the confusion about what to use and what fits best for your use case has also increased rather than decreased. Um, and I think that that's the problem that we want to try to address if we can. Um, <clears throat> so there are some other ways that you might have encountered uh, commercial consensus solutions. Um, and probably the, you know, the two big ones uh, are Spanner and Aurora. So Spanner is Google's um, distributed, uh, globally distributed database. Aurora is Amazon's uh, solution. Um, and they are both uh, very uh, performant, um, but they're performant when you consider the use case of Google and of Amazon. Um, and if you are not, uh, you know, building things like Google products or Amazon products, then the probability that they are 
well tuned to your specific use case is relatively low. So either you're getting uh, optimizations that are not really appropriate for your application or you're spending way more than you need to spend. Um, there's some newer solutions. Cockroach and Yugabyte are probably ones that people, I'm, I'm guessing Postgres uh, people have encountered um, since they really are trying to um, be the distributed solution for people who are using relational um, databases. Uh, Fauna and Titanium DB are two other options uh, that, you know, you know, kind of offer something for the, you know, NoSQL non-relational um, kind of model. Um, but, you know, hopefully, you know, I'm not dissuading you from going global, right? I, I feel like I've been suggesting that, you know, more global equals more problems, but the reality is that more global equals more users. So the best and fastest way to increase your user base is to become a global app. Um, it's just that the, the scaling is, is hard, uh, even with these solutions. So the larger the quorum, the slower your system will be to respond. And it gets worse as the as your data centers get further apart, right? So the latency increases, you have a greater probability of network partitions. And worst of all, uh, servers are gonna respond to co-located clients, which in some cases like you know, economies, like game economies, um, has the effect of privileging players who are have the you know the random chance or luck of being born near a uh, big uh, Amazon region or Google region um, you know at the expense of people who live a little bit further away and that kind of can erode people's trust in these kinds of economies uh, which also bleeds into voting like trust in voting systems and health systems. Um, so it's actually quite serious um, uh, for a lot of a lot of use cases. Um, you know, speaking of regions, uh, commercial cloud really is designed to work best in a very few places. Uh, they're banking on the fact that there are a lot of people in these places and that the people in these places have a lot of money to spend. Um, but if you have users who live in one of these, in not one of these places, uh, your user is likely to have a worse user experience of using your app, potentially such a bad experience that they cease to become users uh, or never become users of your app. So being global is, is a lot harder than it should be, I think. Um, and now, you know, the, the worst of all is that it's getting more complicated all the time. You know, when we did our poll, uh, you know, many people sort of said, well, we're, we're ahead of this problem of GDPR. Uh, the challenge is that there are new regulations that are coming out all the time. You know, if I was going to give this presentation, you know, two months from now, I'm pretty sure this slide would have even more things on it um, because these, uh, you know, data tenancy um, uh, and privacy laws are just coming out. There's new ones all the time. Uh, and it's becoming, you know, much and much harder to make sure that you know and can control where the data, where your user data resides and where your user data is getting replicated to by the internals of the system, potentially without your control or your awareness. Um, and that's, that's potentially a problem, right? Um, so I want to, you know, talk a little bit about a few companies who have tackled this problem. And I, I don't want it to sound like I am picking on these companies because I actually see these companies as trailblazers. Um, you know, people who have, you know, really gone and leaned into these problems and tried to scale and grow and get kind of global usage um, and really kind of come head on with some of the, the problems, hopefully problems that we can all learn from. Um, so the examples I want to talk about are Niantic's Pokemon Go, uh, Signal, and Dropbox. Uh, so potentially some of the people in the audience are Pokemon Go uh, players, or maybe your children uh, played this game. Uh, and so if that's the case, probably you remember uh, what happened when the game was released. And essentially what happened is that it was a disaster. Um, the servers were unloaded or overloaded because the game became popular much faster than, than they were ready for. 
um, you know, they did their best, right? They hosted it on the best of the best. They hosted it on Google Cloud, um, and they have this sort of um, assumption that everything would kind of scale naturally, um, but it did not. Uh, it did not scale. Um, and what happened is that, you know, a lot of people couldn't uh, even download the game. And then people who were able to download the game couldn't log in, uh, couldn't find, uh, you know, the the artifacts um, and really, uh, you know, it caused a lot of UX uh, complaints for the, the poor engineers who were trying to maintain the system. Um, so that's an example, I think, um, you know, a company that, that really tried, um, you know, did everything they could to be ready uh, to scale for a lot of users. And they, they had the good kind of problem where a lot of people signed up and they were not, they were not able to serve all of those people <clears throat> um, another example, uh, which is one of my favorites, is uh, Signal. Um, you know, Signal is, you know, probably, I, I don't have to preach to the choir here, it, you know, the Postgres audience, I'm sure, uh, is sympathetic to Signal's mission, right? It's a 5013C um, organization that's trying their best to um, bring privacy back to uh, you know, chatting and messaging. Um, and essentially what happened is in one week, you know, everything uh, exploded. Um, so, you know, in it was uh, beginning of January 2021, uh, WhatsApp updated their privacy policy to say that, that, you know, all users were opting into sharing data with Facebook. And a few days later, Elon Musk tweeted, um, that you should switch to Signal, and everybody did. And in 24 hours, they went from 10 million users to 50 million users in less than 24 hours. Uh, and it brought the entire service down. Um, I have been a Signal user for, for a while, and there were three days where I couldn't use Signal at all. And, you know, I, I had not been as aware until that moment of, you know, how kind of how important the application had become to my everyday life. Um, so this is, you know, another example, Signal is built on AWS um, and um, the scaling was sort of not automatic. Uh, you know, everything, uh, everything went down. Um, and then my last example here is Dropbox. Um, so uh, potentially there's some Dropbox fans in the audience also. Um, but if you'll remember, in about 2015, 2016, uh, Dropbox decided to, you know, quote unquote, break up with AWS. Um, and they decided to move all of their user data onto a new uh, in-house network um, of data centers called Magic Pocket. So that's their, um, their distributed system is Magic Pocket. Um, and this, you know, this transfer of data involved like actual physical transfer of data. So there were trucks with, you know, with data in it moving across the country, um, you know, trying to, you know, physically move all of this data. And it was not easy and it was not straightforward and it was not cheap to do. But, um, you know, as you can see, uh, since they made that change, you know, Dropbox's annual revenue has steadily increased. It, there is maybe a question about what it will look like in 2021, because that was, as you'll remember, a bit of a strange year um, in terms of people's data usage patterns in 2020 and 2021. Uh, a lot of things have changed. But, you know, I think that it tracks that there's probably some relationship here, you know, that, that uh, using, hosting all of their data on AWS was cutting into their um, profit margins. And they bit the bullet and decided to break away and build their own solution um, and have been able to um, see a lot of success. So I think that's a very interesting story also. Um, but I hope that the takeaway isn't that like, you know, you should adopt one of the solutions that these companies has, has used. I hope that the takeaway really from this talk is gonna be that different systems need different solutions. Um, you know, and only you really know what is most appropriate, you know, how users are using your application, you know, what the throughput is, uh, what your company's scaling goals are, you know, who's likely to be the next million users and where in the world they're coming from. Um, you know that better than, you know, probably anyone else. 
Uh, so we need a better way, I think, to build uh, our own solutions. And to me, this feels like an open source, like a, a, a open source problem. Um, so I think that the solution is that we should all work together and build an open source uh, API for consensus. So that's my pitch to you. Um, you know, wherever you are, um, my hope is that you will um, be interested in collaborating uh, on uh, this new open source project. Um, you know, so I'm going to take a bit of a left turn just to convince you of why I think this is possible. Um, there is a, so, you know, at the beginning of the talk, uh, uh, Lindsay mentioned Scikit-Learn. Um, you know, this is a library that I'm very familiar with. You know, as you know, I'm not really a databases person. I'm a machine learning engineer. Um, so most of my experience comes from, mo most of my open source experience comes from the machine learning world. Um, but I think that the Scikit-Learn story really has an important lesson for us if we're gonna work together on this project. Um, you know, essentially what happened is that Scikit-Learn started as a couple of graduate students working together on a Google Summer of Code project. And what they were doing was converting code that they had written um, as part of their PhD programs um, into a common API. Uh, you know, and, and I think it's important to really um, underpin here that before this happened, in order to do machine learning, you had to go to graduate school for like five years or 10 years. And to do machine learning, you had to write machine learning code from scratch in Fortran or in C. Um, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't open source machine learning um, before, before this. Uh, you know, so you would write this code kind of by yourself, you would publish your dissertation, and then, you know, who knows what would happen to the code. And so the, this group of graduate students got together and tried to think of a way to make all of the different algorithms that they had worked on independently cohere to a common API. And in 2010, a French company that employed many of these, these graduate students after they finished uh, so a French company called Enria released the first version, um, the first open source version of Scikit-Learn. A couple of years later, um, the authors of the package published this paper, API Design for Machine Learning Software, which I definitely recommend that you read. It's a short read. Um, but really, this was the, you know, the first time that many of us were even starting to think about how it might be possible that you could take all of these complex, different machine learning algorithms and house them under a common API. Um, you know, but essentially the, the intuition of Scikit-Learn is that every machine learning model is either an estimator or a transformer. And if it's an estimator, it can fit, which means that it's learning from the data that you give it, and it can predict, which means that it can predict off of a new value, or it's a transformer, meaning you fit it to learn the data space and you transform the data space and produce a new data space that can get used in downstream machine learning. But this idea that you could, whatever it was, a logistic regression, a support vector machine, even maybe a neural network model, any of these types of complex algorithms that function in completely different ways could essentially be boiled down to either an estimator with fit predict or a transformer with fit transform was revolutionary. Um, and now in 2021, there's over 2,000 contributors to this project. You know, it has 47,000 stars. It's, you know, GitHub says that it's being used by, you know, 250,000 projects, and that includes Scikit Yellowbrick, but I'm confident that it's being used by a lot more people than that. This is, you know, the main open source machine learning library in the world. And I could qualify that and say it's the main Python machine learning library, or that it's even more popular than TensorFlow or PyTorch, but it, it is just the most, the most important, you know, uh, machine learning library out there right now because of this common API. Um, and so the Yellow Brick project, which is the one that um, my collaborator, Benjamin Bengfort, and I created about six years ago, um, borrows from this intuition. Um, and so the intuition is that there is no such thing as a best machine learning model in the abstract. So support vector machine, logistic regression, phase, 
um, you know, uh, ensemble, decision tree, random forests, uh, none of those is the best machine learning model um, because it all depends on your data set, on your use case. Um, and so the only thing that you can do is have a series of best practices for identifying the best model for your use case. And that's what yellow brick is for. And that's what I think we should do for distributed systems, right? I think we, we need to do this for consensus um, and really just kind of say, there is no such thing as the best consensus uh, model, the best consensus algorithm. It does not exist. Um, what exists is a lot of different use cases. And so from those use cases, I think we can engineer an API that allows us to experiment. And so this is, uh, this is kind of what I have so far. It's sort of a, a little bit of scratch work um, code, uh, you know, and, and kind of an idea of what the components of the API might be, where we have to figure out networking. So what does it mean to send messages uh, between uh, replicas in the system? You know, how do we decide who's part of the replica network? Um, how do we identify when somebody is joined? How do we reconfigure? Um, if somebody leaves the network, uh, decision making, right? So, do we have a leader oriented system, a leaderless system? Um, how do we de detect conflict? How do we do elections? Um, and then finally, how do we decide when a decision is final and it should get committed to the log? Um, and I think that if we can kind of think about this enough and think about enough use cases, um, I think that we can build an API around this um, and make it open source uh, so that anybody can contribute, anybody can look at the code, um, anybody can use it to experiment uh, for their use case and identify what makes the most sense um, for them and for their application or for their organization. Um, and so that it's free for everyone to, um, to interact with. Uh, so um, with that in mind, um, I will make a sort of um, call to the audience. Uh, if you're interested in contributing to this uh, project, I would be delighted um, to have you reach out. You can visit this tiny URL um, to let me know how I can get in touch with you. Um, and also, if you just want to share some ideas about what you think uh, this API should do, what types of behavior it should support, um, you know, any problems that you foresee, that would be incredibly helpful, um, very valuable. And I'd be so, you know, so grateful for any kind of contribution, large or small. Um, and if you are not really in a place right now where you're interested in contributing to a project, I completely understand it's been a tough year or two. Uh, and if you just want to vent and talk about some of the problems that you're observing um, that you think might be informative to me or to the project, uh, feel free to, to shoot me an email. Um, I'm Rebecca at rotational.io, um, and I'd be happy to, uh, to listen and learn from you and to learn from what you're observing. Um, and that's all I've got for you. So thanks very much for coming to the talk and for your attention. Um, and I'm excited to, to hear from you. Uh, very thorough, really exciting stuff. Um, I want to thank First and foremost, Rebecca, thank you so much for, for joining us, for giving us this awesome presentation and, and sort of thing to chew on. Um, and then I wanna also thank our attendees for spending a little bit of their day with us. So um, I hope to see you on future Postcast Conference webinars and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>